Okay, cool. Now it's working. So last time we just like completely skipped over the existence of the square roots in the real numbers. And if you don't know what I'm talking about or don't know what context I'm pulling from, this video right here is what happened last week and that will give you additional context, but I don't really think that it's necessary to understand what is in this video. So if you want, if you want more context, then this is the place to go. If, you, if you're fine, then you can continue watching here. It'll be great. Now we could just talk about square roots existing in the real numbers, but we can actually do a little bit better. And for any natural number M, we can talk about the existence of the Mth root in the real numbers. At least that's what we're going to prove today. You should be able to prove that you can take irrational roots or rational roots of numbers and those will also be in the real numbers, but the proof that we're going to provide today is just for natural numbers um, because those are easier to work with and the proof is just like a little bit more straightforward than if we had irrational numbers just hanging out. Anyway, in order to do this, we're going to have to take a step back and look at the rationals and think about the reals as if we didn't already know what was in the real numbers. So to start out, it's very tempting to just look at the equation y to the m is equal to n and say that, okay, since y to the m is equal to n, y should be equal to the mth root of n. That assumes a lot of information. So the biggest thing that it assumes is what number system you're working in. And so if you were working in the rational numbers, it's not guaranteed that the mth root of n exists in the rational numbers. And so we need to take a step back and think about where we're coming from. So with that little bit of intuitive information, we can go ahead and continue on with thinking about the rationals universally without assuming any knowledge of what is in R or what R looks like. So if you're living in a world where all you think exists are the rational numbers, then you might be tempted to say that we could just take the rational numbers to be a line. And we're gonna say that that line is all of the rational numbers and they still have all the properties that we generally agree on them having. So I mean that x is a rational number if the decimal expansion of x terminates in a repeating string. So for instance, if one half was your rational number, then one half is 0 0.50 repeating. And so we'll continue to think about rational numbers this way. However, if you take that definition of rational and you also take that picture of rational, someone could come up and propose a number like say x equals 0 0.01, 0.11, all the way up to 0, 1 to the n, 0, 1 to the n plus 1, and so forth. And they could claim that, hey, this number is not in your line because it doesn't terminate in a repeating string. So recognizing that this number exists that has been presented, we would have to concede that our original idea for our universal picture of the rational numbers would be very wrong because the real picture would have holes in it at all of these numbers that are like the 0 0.01, 0 0.011, 0 0.111, 0 0.1111, 0 0.1111, 1, 1, dot 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 zero one to the n zero one to the n plus one number those numbers that don't terminate in a periodic string of digits so the natural question here is what is a number system that doesn't have any of these holes and we're going to be able to get at that by thinking about the axiom of completeness so the standard way to capture the real numbers relationship to these gaps in the rational numbers in introductory real analysis is to introduce the axiom of completeness as a property of the real numbers. And this axiom states that every bounded subset of the real numbers has a least upper bound in the real numbers. But it also gives us a framework for showing that holes that were in the rationals are actually in the reals. So we can go ahead and argue that numbers like that weird x from before are real numbers by defining a set A and then showing that the least upper bound of that set is actually the x in question. 
Of course, this requires proof. And that's kind of the point. We wanna know why these gaps, and specifically for this video, that square roots and mth roots for natural numbers m exist in the real numbers. And so that thought process is going to give us our baseline for arguing for the existence of mth roots for natural numbers m. Before we go ahead and continue, I'm gonna go ahead and list some things as references here on the right side of the board. First off, we'll give the definition of supremum. If you haven't watched the previous video, I also talk about supremums there. So if you've seen this before, it will be familiar. I might have written it a different way or like a slightly different way, but the essence of the definition is the same between the two. So the supremum of a set A is just the least upper bound of A. So if we have the supremum of a set, then that supremum S is both an upper bound on A and it is the least such upper bound. I'll go ahead and leave it as an exercise to show that the supremum of a set is unique. The other thing that we'll need to give a nod to and reference during this proof is the Archimedean property, which states that for every real number R, there exists natural numbers N and M, such that one over N is less than R and M is greater than R. I could spend some time proving that, but it would get us pretty off track from where we wanna go. So I'll probably cover it in another video. It doesn't really fit into the very niched topic of this month, which is square roots and their relationship to higher math and places they come up in higher math. But for now, we're just gonna say that this is a property that the real numbers have and continue on accordingly. So with those two things addressed, we can continue on with our argument to prove existence of roots in the real numbers. So like I mentioned before, we need a set where we think the supremum of that set is an mth root. And then we just need to prove that the set in question actually has that supremum. We'll just take t equal to the set of all real x such that x to the mth power is less than c. Our proposition is that the supremum of our set T is the mth root of C. So there are two properties of the supremum and we're gonna to need to be able to appeal to both of them in order to successfully prove the existence of roots. We'll let the supremum of T equal alpha and we'll start the proof by assuming that alpha to the mth power is less than C. Since alpha is the supremum by definition, it is an upper bound of T. So for every Y in T, Y is less than or equal to alpha. So we go ahead and consider the expression of some small increment of alpha raised to the nth power. The small increment we'll be taking here is one over N, where N is some arbitrary natural number. Using binomial expansion, we have this fairly ugly summation. And if you don't know what this parenthetical mk situation is, that's just m choose k, it's equal to m factorial over k factorial times m minus k factorial. And then since we're doing analysis, we're really just worried about how numbers are comparing to one another. And we're gonna wanna make everything we can larger. And so we can do that by removing the powers from the one over n terms. And so we can rewrite this as so with the appropriate inequality added in. This is the part where we go ahead and give a nod to the Archimedean property. We'll acknowledge that there exists a particular one over n, call it one over n sub zero, such that the following is true. Rearranging this ugly inequality to have the summation gunk above the n sub zero and moving the alpha to the mth power to the left side gives us alpha to the m plus some positive thing is less than c. We can go ahead and call upon our earlier consideration with the more general one over n inequalities to grant us that alpha plus one over n sub zero quantities to the mth power is actually less than c, which directly contradicts the assumption that alpha was an upper bound as alpha plus one over n sub zero would then be an element of t such that alpha is not greater than it. And so from this contradiction, we know that alpha to the mth power is not less than c. And we can continue on to the second case, which is where alpha to the mth power is greater than c. It turns out that this case is fairly similar to the previous case. But instead of considering an increment, we're going to be considering a decrement or something slightly smaller than our alpha. And we can go through the computation as follows. 
We'll look at the same expression just with a negative sign in front of the 1 over n, and we'll do much of the same manipulation, but instead we're interested in making things smaller instead of larger. And we can do that by first removing all of the positive terms and then by removing the powers of the 1 over n terms to get this ugly sum. We can just rename the ugly sum as a to make things easier moving forward. We'll go ahead and give the same nod to the Archimedean property, but this time we take alpha to the nth power minus c instead of the other way around to make sure that the number on the right side is still a positive real number because alpha to the nth power is greater than c in this case. We can then get the inequality into a similar position by multiplying both sides by negative one and rearranging as necessary. We again look to our 1 over n expression analysis to make the following inequality chain, and we can determine that alpha minus 1 over n sub 0 is less than alpha, but it is greater than c, making it an upper bound that is less than the least upper bound, which is again a contradiction. So we know that alpha to the nth power cannot be less than or greater than c. So it has to be exactly equal to c. And the only other way to have that be the case is for the supremum of the set to be the mth root of c. And then we can go ahead and appeal to the axiom of completeness to imply that the mth root of c exists in the real numbers. And so that pretty much gets us there. Um, the only thing I'll say is that it might have been a little technical to do the mth roots in general to start out because there's that whole binomial expansion thing and I didn't really explain where that formula comes from but it is a well-known fact from computational algebra so what I would suggest is that if you were to go back and use m equal to 2 and go through the same inequalities and same um, and the same arithmetic you'll get to the result that shows that square roots are in the real numbers I just decided to go through a more general argument. That addresses the whole square roots and further mth roots of numbers exist in the real numbers. I guess the thing that's really cool about this proof is that what we've actually done is we proved something that most folks take for granted whenever they're doing mathematics. Um, and it's not to say that this isn't something that's well known. It is for sure very well known and that's why a lot of people take it for granted. But it's cool to see how the structure and the logic come together to get you to this very elementary fact about the real numbers and their structure. Um, and it tells us a little bit about like how much better of a number system the real numbers are, at least from an analysis point of view. Anyway, the other really cool thing about this is that the axiom of completeness actually can be proven as a theorem of different methods of constructing the real numbers. And so even though I said that usually the axiom of completeness is taken as like fact, right? Um, there are, if you wanna get really into the weeds, you can do certain constructions of the real numbers from the rationals, like using decadent cuts to construct the reals. And you can then use that construction method to prove that the axiom follows from it, or it has to follow from it. And so there's some consistency there between this axiom that we would assume in elementary analysis and then just the nitty gritty of logical set construction, which is, I think is pretty cool. Anyway, uh, yes, I'm gonna cut myself off because I could probably ramble on about this for quite a while, um, but yeah. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more mathematical content. If you now are interested in the context, which was the birthing of this video, you can check that out over, I guess the card is still up there somewhere hanging out. It was there before, but it should be, you know, it's there, it'll be there. Uh, but yeah, as always, I am Nathan, this is Chalk, and I will see you next time.